Hi you guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Sarah and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, definitely come back every week so you don't miss a new upload. So today's case was requested by Valencia and thank you so much for this suggestion because crazy enough, I'm kind of really into this topic right now. I've been watching and researching a lot of it lately. I have been watching the Our Father series on Netflix and oh my god if you guys haven't seen it it's wild. Today's case however is I think way worse than that one though and if you don't know what I'm talking about I'm talking about cults. Today's case is about the Ant Hill Kids. It's a cult and it's pretty brutal, pretty graphic and yeah, I would say definitely buckle up for this one. Now, this story is, again, brutal, like I said, so there's going to be a trigger warning right now. It deals with physical, emotional, sexual abuse. And keep in mind, there's a lot of information, and I'm giving you my version of the story, what I've read and researched. So if there's more information that you guys would like to share, definitely leave it in the comments. And let's get into today's case. So before we actually get into the Ant Hill Kids cult, I feel like let's just define what a cult is. And normally I feel like people just label a cult as just a religion that people don't like. But in fact, a cult has a few defining characteristics that, that actually separate it from just like people's crazy prophecies. So first off, a cult needs to be comprised of first generation members. Converts are actually usually going to be more passionate and which makes them more easily moldable into devotees. And then cults always market towards like a certain demographic. And this doesn't mean that everyone's going to fall into this demographic, but it's usually like based off something that everyone has in common. So their race, their gender, their religion, things like that. And then thirdly, and most arguably the most important one is cults always have like a super charismatic leader. And this is important to attract new members, keep the belief of current members, and then like rationalize their radicalization and their theories. And in the case of the Ant Hill kids, every one of these things was true. This cult essentially had like hit the mark on everything. So the Ant Hill kids, they were actually originally members from another religion, I guess, which was the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And this actually started in Quebec. And the leader of this cult was a man named Rock Theriol. Now, Rock was born on May 16th, 1947 in Quebec to Hyacinth and Pierrette Rock. And in his early life, he was actually considered a really smart, intelligent kid. As a child, he claims that he was severely beaten by his father. He says he was beaten to the point where his internal organs were even scarred, which is a possible route for his violent fantasies and sociopathic narcissism but his father completely denies this he's like I never ever laid a hand on my son however his neighbors also confirmed these beatings took place and look especially back in the day I'm sure people beat their kids I'm sure it was like more common you know people claim that his upbringing you know that these neighbors have also confirmed could be the reason for his sadistic tendencies. His father was an avid member of this Catholic group called the White Berets, and he was known to have his own sort of tendencies and forms of punishment. Like he would make his children kick each other in the shins as hard as they could until like they begged to stop as a form of punishment. Rock was also made uh, to go door to door to rally for his father's group, the White Berets, and he hated this. I mean, like most kids would, who wants to go door to door and like talk about religion, you know, like unless something, it's something that you're passionate about, but if you're doing it because your dad makes you do it, it's like so annoying. And he actually would get made fun of by kids for this. Now something like weird and like, I mean, it's not weird because I guess in today's society, this would also be something to brag about, but Something that they claim why Rock also was this like severe narcissist is, is because he had a very large member. Penis. So they're saying, you know, this could have had something to do 
with his narcissism, but also the fact that he probably got a lot of attention from ladies due to this. This also contributed to who he was as a person. And again, being good with the ladies, that's another trait of a, um, you know, cult leader. And he was pretty popular at school and even in school, he did well with the ladies. I mean, and this makes sense because if they're not popular and they're not charming and they're not, like they don't have something that intrigues people, then they they wouldn't be leaders. So he grew up Catholic, but in the seventh grade when he was 13, he dropped out of school to um, pursue the Old Testament. I feel like this was also contributed by the fact that his father would like force him to rally for the White Berets. So he was like, I'm going to do my own thing. Like, you know, kids, they... They want to do the opposite of what you force them to do. So he basically ended up like hating the white berets and just Roman Catholicism in general. And I think that is due to the fact that he was forced into it. Also that school that he went to, the town's local school, they like stopped providing education for some reason at the seventh grade. So when kids turned 13 and I don't know if it was the parents' responsibility to go and like give them further education because it was clear that Rock was really smart and he loved learning. So in a way it's sad that he just stopped his education at that age because who knows what would have happened if he was more educated. Like that's weird to me because where are his parents, you know, like don't they, like if his dad was so into religion, I feel like schooling is also something that would be important. They go hand in hand in a way. Now it's hard to find like clear, solid, informative, information about Rock's childhood and I feel like it would have been really interesting to know more about him. So following leaving his school he developed like this obsession with the apocalypse in the Old Testament especially like the strict I guess views and influence on masculine authority and I think it's believed that his initial interest into what we're about to talk about stemmed from this Old Testament belief. So I was literally talking and I didn't even hit record so that's fun. What I was saying was in 1967 Rock he marries his first wife Francine Grenier and she was am I recording yep and she was 17 and he was like 21 at the time but this marriage it quickly deteriorated because Rock ended up developing like health issues and then he also like abused alcohol. See, Rock had these like severe stomach ulcers which caused him a lot of pain. And due to this severe pain, he ended up having to have multiple surgeries to help with it. But apparently these surgeries, and I don't know if it was due to the technology or due to just the surgeons, these surgeries, they didn't go well at all and they didn't actually help him much. And he was actually left with a further condition um, called dumping syndrome. So lovely name. But this syndrome basically means that the food that you consume or that Rock consumed, um, like moved through his digestive system too quickly. So, you know, normally you eat, it takes a while for your stomach to process it get to your intestines, things like that. But with Rock, it would just go straight to his intestines and it would leave him with more symptoms apart from the pain, like nausea, lightheadedness. Um, he would just feel crap, literally. So because of this, he turned to drugs and alcohol to help with the pain. And, you know, in a way I understand this and I feel sorry for him because anyone with chronic pain or chronic illnesses would just understand, like, this is a frustrating thing to go through. And especially back then, like the help or technology or whatever you want to call it probably wasn't that good. So it just left him like being angry, frustrated. And, you know, when you marry someone, that's not the person you married. So I can understand why their marriage didn't do well. So during this time, Rock would tell Francine like, oh, I'm heading to Quebec City to, you know, sell my woodworks and to basically work. But when he actually traveled there, he would actually you know, basically travel to just fool around with other women. There was one woman over there that he, you know, began a relationship with and her name was Giselle and Giselle would form a very crucial part to this case. And the two of them would become very close. A few years into their marriage, Rock's financial situation then began to deteriorate, like their home was repossessed, they weren't, you know, making any money. And then following when the house became repossessed, Francine was, you know, obviously like, 
I'm done. So after seven years, she filed for divorce from Rock. But I don't think it was just the financial issues that made her sort of do it. I think it was everything, you know, like his health issues. The, he became angry. He was obviously cheating. I'm sure she knew. And then he also um, joined the Seventh Day Adventist Church. So all of this combined was enough for her to be like, bye. So he converted to the Seventh Day Adventist Church and he soon began following their way of life. He became obsessed and then he relinquished alcohol, processed food, cigarettes. But as quick as he basically joined the church, he became banned from it essentially. And this was after he attempted to gain leadership because he found that the beliefs of the Adventist church did not really line up with his radicalized views. And then from this point onwards, he would talk a lot about the end of the world and the difference between good and evil. And he would begin to sort of be obsessed with it, you know, essentially. But prior to him being banned, he was somewhat of a figurehead in the Adventist church. And, you know, when he was doing this, he would hang out at this girl, remember Giselle? He would hang out at Giselle's apartment a lot. Now, this was the same Giselle he cheated on Francine with. And a lot of like young people who still lived with their parents at the time, they would also hang around Giselle's apartment a lot at the time. And due to this, they'd obviously be spending a lot of time with Rock. And they sort of became obsessed with Rock's teachings and preachings. Soon after this, he started up this thing, a clinic, called the Healthy Living Clinic, where he sold health literature and organic foods. Now, against the will of, you know, most of their parents, he also persuaded these young children who would come to Giselle's apartment to join him. He asked them to join this clinic and help him, where he claimed he provided holistic healing advice. And at the time, I believe it was around eight people that he had persuaded to join him. Now, these people left their real life to join rock, their families, their jobs, their incomes, their, their friends. And the females that joined would all compete for rock's attention. And I mean, how charismatic or how believable must he have been for people to literally go and do this? Like I am the most skeptical person. I've said this so many times. Like I would just be like, no, thank you. Like he must have had something that really, really persuaded you. He wasn't even anyone really at this point. He was just a member of that church. So now because all the females were like, rock, rock, like vying for his attention, Giselle became super jealous of this. And then she was like, I'm just going to do something about it. And she actually asked Rock to marry her. She proposed to him. He said yes, and they got married on January 8th in uh, 1978. So now this healthy living clinic where he provided, you know, healing advice. Rock had no medical background. He didn't even finish high school. However, you know, after his stomach surgery, he became so obsessed with the medical field and he wanted to learn more about it. He believed that he knew better than a doctor. Okay. He honestly was clueless. And I feel like this clinic was just this like veiled attempt to make people believe him to gain more power. You know, I feel like he preyed on vulnerable people. I mean, who else better than to prey on people who are, who have illnesses and people who want to be healed, you know, especially at the time if like the doctors and stuff weren't helping this healthy living clinic, maybe this can help. So Rock ends up meeting this man whose wife was being treated for leukemia. Her name was Geraldine or Claire, and she was 38 years old and she was being treated for leukemia in the, like in a real hospital. But Rock convinced her husband, uh, Geraldine's, Geraldine's husband to check Geraldine out of the hospital and to bring her to come and receive treatment at his clinic, the healthy living clinic. So this guy, you know, believed Rock. So he checks his wife out. He brings her to this healthy living clinic and the regimen, you know, to heal her was that she needed to live on a program of grape juice and organic food. That was her regimen, grape juice and organic food to cure her of um, leukemia. Now, how do you guys think this went at the healthy living clinic? She was actually being treated for it at the hospital, but at the healthy living clinic, she soon died. Now, although no charges were pressed, this did bring 
attention to the clinic, the police were now kind of becoming aware of this clinic. Now, I don't know why after this failed attempt, people still brought their family members to this clinic, but people were bringing their sick friends, family members to this clinic in the hopes that it was gonna cure them. So at this point, the police are aware of this clinic and Rock knows that the police are aware of the clinic. And then the police knew that Rock knew that the police knew that they were aware of this clinic. Everyone was aware of it. Now this clinic and the death of some people, well, Geraldine, was not the reason why the Seventh Day Adventist people, like the, the leaders, banned Rock from it. The reason why they actually banned him, and this is why sometimes like, and don't come for me, but religion is so twisted, okay? Because they banned him from the clinic because they were not seeing any of the monies from the like profits of the clinic. So they were like, you opened up this clinic in our name and you're not gonna give us any of the profits. That's literally why they banned him. And they thought like, okay, well, if, you know, Rock gets banned from this church, his followers, like whoever believes in him is also going to leave him and jump off the bandwagon. Like they're not gonna believe in him after we, the leaders, banned him, you know? But this was like the opposite of what was gonna happen. Because of this, Rock's like, all right, well, what can I do to keep my place and keep my popularity? So he goes off into like the mountains and he starts preaching from the mountains, encouraging followers to come to him and like he was some type of prophet. And again, this is super common with cult leaders and his small group, you know, of little followers, they, his disciples essentially, they left the church, the Seventh Day Adventist church, to go to the mountains to follow rock, like the power. So now during these, you know, rants essentially in the woods, rock claimed, you know, he had a prophecy. He claimed that God told him that the world was going to end on February 17th, 1979. Like he was that specific about the date that an apocalypse was coming. And you know, what's new? There's always an apocalypse coming. They always say something like that. Even in the Our Father series on Netflix, the guy was like, there's an apocalypse coming. Like there's always one. But he told his followers, you know, you have nothing to fear. He said, you know, God told me that I am the chosen one. And if you all abide by my rules, you will be spared. And people believed him. So now to prepare for this apocalypse that was coming in 1997, Rock and his followers. So all together, there were four men, nine women and four children, I believe. They all moved to a place which they named Eternal Mountain, which was basically like the wilderness in Ontario. And they moved here because Rock had this calling that it was the Holy Land and that's where they were supposed to be. Here they built this commune of tents and log cabins. And then Rock tells all his followers like, you have to dress in matching robes and we all have to be one community. But in reality, this was basically to strip them of any, you know, individuality. He then renamed his like group, his cult, essentially. He calls them the Ant Hill Kids. And that was basically a name to address how they worked for him. Like they were hard workers, you know, like ants, they work really hard and they like bring stuff back to the Ant Hill. Like that's why they were called the Ant Hill Kids. But soon you know, you guys know what's about to happen. He was about to literally impose the most violent torture and way of life for any human being that like I've heard of. So Rock was now known as Moses, you know, or Papa, and that's how his followers had to address him. And they had to address his wife, Giselle, as Mama. He then had a revelation, you know, that he had to become a polygamist, poly polygamist, and marry the women in the in in the following. He declared that all previous marriages that he performed were now annulled, and he had to marry every single woman um, in the commune except for one woman who was there with her husband. And that the only reason you know he didn't marry her is because her husband like wouldn't allow it. So now they're all following him in the cult, you know, since 1977. And then now 1979 comes, you know, the year of the apocalypse, it's February, and it actually came and went. There was no apocalypse. What happened? So weirdly, you know, you would think that the people in the cult would be like, okay, well, mate, like, what happened? Like, what happened to the big apocalypse? But he tells them the reason, you know, why this apocalypse didn't happen was because it was just a mix-up. 
It was a mix up with some dates. The differences between the Israelite and the Roman Catholic calendar were, were different. And, you know, the dates basically got mixed up in the communication to God. And that's why it didn't happen. So this was a stupid explanation. But despite this, none of them stopped following him. Like they weren't like, okay, well, this guy's full of shit. Like they literally kept romanticizing him and his preachings. He literally became their absolute leader. I mean, two years at that point, I it's now a way of living, right? So he convinced the group, you know, although it was a really small group, that they had to give up everything and follow him. I mean, they had already given up their jobs and everything like that. So to give up a little bit more now, you know, probably didn't seem unfathomable. Unfathomable. And that's, again, you know, a common thing with what I've been reading and researching, like these leaders, they always want you to give up everything because especially your families and they convince you that, you know, your families don't care about you and no one loves you and only I love you and you need to be with me and I will show you the way. And soon enough, life in this commune became super bizarre. The, you know, good times essentially would come to an end and Rock then began impregnating all the women that he had married. He ended up fathering multiple children by multiple women, multiple. Now, the violence and <clears throat> behavior and way of life that the cult, you know, had to live and abide by was mainly due to two reasons. Firstly, one was because Rock believed himself to be a super skilled surgeon. So he would perform surgeries like castrations and amputations by himself without even like giving the, the patient essentially anesthesia. Can you imagine? More importantly to him, at the core of the beliefs of the Ant Hill Kids cult, he believed that in order for, you know, a member or a person in general to have this like amazing pain-free afterlife, you know, when they pass on, in their current life, they have to suffer a great deal, a great deal. And that's how they enter this, you know, beautiful kingdom after death. In reality, he was just a twisted fuck. Let's, let's be real. He was a sadist and this cult served no other purpose, no other purpose, but to, you know, satisfy his sick and twisted, deepest, darkest desires. His fantasies of what he wanted to do. I mean, if he wanted to be a surgeon, it's like he was playing a doctor on real life victims. Like, can you imagine what type of a human being that would be? And I haven't even gotten into like what we're about to get into. This type of human being must have zero care for others. I really believe that because if that's what he wanted to do and these, you know, poor people, they believed that he was, you know, doing the right thing and everything that he was saying was true. They must have had no clue that deep down he was doing these things for fun, you know, and let's keep talking about it. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what he actually did to all his followers and it's pretty horrific. So the most kind of like common form of cruelty that Rock would impose on his members was burning them. So he would burn their skin and limbs until it bubbled and broke. He would break their limbs, chop fingers and toes off, pulled out their teeth with pliers. He would slash their skin with glass, like cut glass. And he would also like tie Oh, rubber bands around the like the members of the men their testicles he would do that until this wound would form and they would get a really severe infection if you know one of them said oh you know i'm feeling a little bit nauseous he would inject 90 percent um like you know those like like rubbing alcohol 90 percent rubbing alcohol directly into their stomachs huh most of his followers actually lost limbs, teeth, fingers, toes due to his practice, his healthy living clinic. I'm guessing it was just what he probably convinced them that he was, that's why he was doing this. Ugh. So while he was conducting these, you know, acts on his followers, he was claiming that everything that he was doing was done out of love, which I think is the most twisted way to be because these poor people Unfortunately, believe that this is love, that this is the way to be loved. 
because I don't think any sane, you know, person who was just a strong person would be like, yeah, that's normal. That's, that's a normal way to live. Any accidental deaths that would take place, you know, in the cult, he was never like murderous about them. Like he wasn't excited by them. He would actually act like so upset, like this great deal of pain would come onto him, but he kept doing it, right? So clearly he, know, he knew what he was doing. Any accidental deaths that took place were really painful for him because this just meant that there was one less person to love him and love on him. This love that Rock had for everyone, the funny thing is for all this love, he hated children and he bore so many of them. Well, he didn't bear it, but he had so many kids biologically. But the funny thing is he just hated kids. Like he wasn't a fan of children, which is <sighs> so frustrating. This was obviously an issue for them and the cult because he had so many of them. This cult ended up having nearly 30 children, most of which were actually Rock's biological children. And the saddest thing is the kids were never spared from any of this behavior, the sexual abuse or the torture. Like they were just considered normal, normal ways to live inside this cult. In fact, one of the most like, because obviously this cult had a lot of deaths, right? And one of the most notable deaths was one of his own kids so when they're pappy so the kids would have to call him pappy not papa or moses when their pappy became angry he would take on the role of a surgeon one child he murdered you know as part of a failed circumcision which you know he didn't consider murder and then one of them even though he technically didn't do this, one of them, and I'll explain later, died during a blizzard. There were so many disciplinary practices in this freaking cult that are ridiculous to me. And I don't know how these people even did it, but he would like force members to break, you ready? Their own legs with sledgehammers. He would ask them to shoot each other in the shoulders, eat the feces of rats, insects, other like, you know, little creepy crawlers, including their own feces yeah just eat it why because rock said so he would nail children to a tree and then force other kids to throw rocks at the child that was nailed to the tree he would forcibly remove you know people including children's arms and legs and remove teeth and nails and he would actually do this without any kind of warning like he would just be sitting there and then be like all right and then he would just like get up and like wanna like if you're there get your tooth cut out like it just <sighs> Like imagine living there, that the fear, he made his members sit naked in the freezing cold. Remember, this is Canada, freezing cold for no reason. And if they were sitting there and he felt like it, he would whip and beat them. Like nothing was too cruel for Rock. Like he was just like, it's the cult, the cults, it's the cult's way, you know, like it's, it's God told me to do it, guys. I didn't beat you because I wanted to. I beat you because God actually told me like, hey, you need to get beaten so that you can come into this best resting place after you die. So obviously, as you guys are beginning to figure out, life within a commune, it just changes according to what the prophet or the leader believes it should change and adapt to. So now remember, they like renounced meat and processed food and alcohol and all that kind of stuff. Rock decided that, no, you know, we need to bring this back, probably because he missed it and he wanted to basically do whatever he wanted. So now he began eating meat again, but I don't think he actually gave it to the other commune members. He also abandoned his like healthy way of living and began consuming junk food again, which no one else was allowed to do, by the way. And something that is just so sick and twisted, there was a woman, she had multiple sclerosis and he prostituted her out, okay, to a grocer. So this man who wanted her was just a sick, like as a not wanted her in that way, but I mean, who was willing to barter for that, for groceries and milk and cheese and things like that was just a sick. So she was disabled and in, in return for sex from the grocer, he would get like milk, meat, cheese, groceries, basically things like that. Again, his uh, alcoholism continued. He began drinking very heavily and this obviously, you know, made life for the members even worse because alcohol now was influential in his decision making and how he felt. He became even more demeaning of his followers. He exerted such dominance onto these poor people. And you know, they they were just too like weak, both physically and mentally to fight back because look what he had done to them. Most of them were probably all disabled at this point. And I wonder if that was purposely done or whether he just did that 
to, I mean, cutting open a woman's stomach to pull out her intestines. It's like he was literally playing doctor. Like, you know, when you're young and you're like, oh, I wonder what this will do. Like, it's literally like he was living out those fantasies and he was able to do it. People were freaking letting him do it because they were so manipulated. He also forbade the members within his own commune to speak to each other unless he was present. Like, that is fear. He also conducted gladiator tournaments where he would force um, members in the commune to go and fight against each other, like, in the dirt. And whenever he thought that the followers were, like, going to leave him, like, he thought, okay, maybe, you know, they're going to figure it out eventually, he became more violent. Like, that was his way of controlling the situation. Rock used to, you know, hit the followers with belts, but then he soon graduated to hitting them with hammers and the flat side of an axe. Like, can you imagine? Now, it was said that after Rock committed all these horrific acts. And I mean, I don't even know how many I've mentioned to you guys, but there was definitely more incidents that took place. He would apparently feel horrible. And the next day he would beg and get down on his knees and speak to God, you know, about why all of this was taking place. He would say, you know, God, stop making me do this. You know, I don't want to do this to people. Like, why are you using me as your vessel to communicate these prophecies and carry out these punishments? These teachings, you know, are just for the for the um, greater good. But why must it be me, Lord? You know, like that's the kind of stuff he would and he would do this in front of his followers so come on i'm guessing whenever the members saw this they believed him even more they were like look how remorseful he is he must not mean it he must be possessed by you know the lord and i don't know you guys comment down below are you the type of people to believe things i mean i know nowadays people don't really believe that kind of stuff but not really i mean these things still happen you know but are you easily like do you guys believe things easily i'm such a what's the word? Like, um, skeptic, I think. Like, I'm just like, Psh. this, this says, this shampoo says it's gonna, you know, <laughs> do this to my hair. And I'm like, yeah, right. Like, I really just don't believe things. And especially someone t telling me these kinds of things, I'm just gonna be like, no, you know? So it around 1981, a new, like, guy, guy, um, joined the cult. His name was Guy Veer. And he joined in 1981, like around three years into the cult's formation. And he actually had a history of hospitalization for depression. And he, you know, found out about Rock through like the newspaper, through some article that was written about him. And in this newspaper, the newspaper, the article referred to Rock as this gentle mountain man. And they, you know, basically said he's just living this humble you know, quiet life up in the mountains and he's just a gentle little dude. So Guy was like, oh my God, I need to go meet this gentle human being. Okay, dude. So anyway, Guy comes and he's like, I want to join, you know, your, not your cult, but I want to join, you know, whatever you're doing, you you gentle mountain man. And obviously he was allowed to. And he was given the role as a babysitter. But he only looked after the children in the commune that were not biologically rocks. Like he didn't, like even though rock hated children, hated freaking everything, he felt that his kids were too good to be looked after by this new guy, Guy Veer. Now the only kids that weren't biologically rocks at this point were only like, like and that were young enough to be requiring a babysitter were three children two two-year-old boys and one four-year-old girl. So Veer, guy, he was too unworthy to look after Rock's children. So one day he's babysitting these kids, right? And one of the boys, um, the two-year-old boys, his name was Samuel. He wouldn't stop crying because he actually had difficulty urinating. Maybe he got a UTI or something like that. And, and the sad thing is like, you don't even know how he got this UTI, like with everything that Rock was doing. I don't want to think about it. Anyway, so we had pain urinating and guy the babysitter he got so frustrated at this little two-year-old boy that he started beating him in the face Ooh, if i was there oh my god i would kick his ass literally oh it just makes me so mad okay so guy then tells rock like hey this boy can't pee he's crying so rock or should i say dr rock he's like i can fix him he comes in ready to perform surgery on little two-year-old Samuel. And I, and I'm probably going to cry and I'm probably going to cry saying this. So how am I going to, how am I not going to cry? Like even talking about this? Oh my God. So 
he sliced open little two two year old Samuel's. Okay, and he did this with some scissors, and he poured rubbing alcohol down this little boy's throat, believing I don't even know if he believed it, but as anesthetic was his reasoning. And then obviously Samuel wouldn't stop crying it because there was no anesthesia. Of course, he's two years old. Uh, Look, I'm not going to get too into it because I'm going to get upset. But basically, he wouldn't stop crying. So Rock then orders Guy to go and beat Samuel, okay, to stop him crying. Now, obviously, as we all know, Samuel then ends up dying from his injuries, probably due to blood loss and severe shock or something like that. He's two. And this hurts me so bad. And I don't, I'm like, I don't want to talk about it because this is my son's age. So it's like so, so upsetting. <sighs> Poor Samuel. And can you imagine being his mother and maybe watching this or knowing that this was happening to your son? Like, I can't even, I can't. Okay. Anyway, all these poor kids. Anyway, so now Samuel died. So now they have to conceal Samuel's death, right? So the commune then gathers together. I don't know if Samuel's mother was involved in this, but I'm guessing even if she didn't want to be, she had no say. They then gather together and they set Samuel's body on fire, you know, hoping that it's just going to disintegrate and disappear. And I don't know if at the time, like, the state was keeping record of all these kids being born into the commune. Like, I'm not sure um, if they were giving birth, you know, privately in the wilderness. Like, there's no hospital records or anything, you know. So now, because Samuel had died, someone needed to be punished. And the guy that needed to be punished was Guy Veer. Because, you know, it's all his fault. So Rock then castrated Guy. Okay. And then ordered his followers to say that Guy had been trampled um, on. Guy had been trampled on by a horse. Nevertheless, the truth came out about the commune, and the police then raided it, and they discovered like the burnt, charred remains of poor little Samuel. And like I read somewhere that I think Guy like ran away to the hospital or something, and that's how it came out. I'm not exactly sure how, but it was something like that. So now after this, Rock and eight others were then arrested and charged with criminal negligence, not murder, um, criminal negligence that caused bodily harm. And luckily, some of the kids in the commune at this point by the police were then rehomed, like 20 of them, I think. And I wish all of them were taken, but I think about 20 of them were taken and rehomed and given to foster families and things like that. So after his arrest, Rock willingly undergoes psychiatric evaluation he was calm friendly you know just seemed normal and he denied that he was the leader of any cult you know any commune he claimed it was a democracy where everyone had a say and the way the decisions were made <clears throat> in the commune was based on like a majority vote um, regardless of what his personal preferences were like he completely lied he told the interviewers that you know people in the commune they lived you know, in peace and without any um, sexual promiscuit promiscuity. All of them, all nine of them, including Rock, they all pled not guilty to the charges that were brought forth to them, but all of them were convicted, but they all got really light charges. Rock was sentenced to two years in jail and three years probation. Guy was actually found to be mentally incompetent and he was sent to a mental hospital. However, Rock was just released like a year later in February of 1984, a year later. The most fucked up thing is that at this point, you know, he was already arrested. Like there was already suspicion. They should have looked deeper into everything. I'm talking about the police. And all of this should have ended right then and there. Like it should have just ended. He was already hurting people. Like the murders were being committed, just being disguised as accidental deaths. Police should have charged him with murder, he should have been put away for life. But these freaking followers for that year stayed devoted to Rock. And when he returned, they ended up like moving their commune somewhere else, you know, to just basically get away from everyone again. So they reassembled the commune and then they constructed a cabin in Burnt River in Ontario. And so the Ant Hill kids, they began, you know, earning their living from um, selling baked goods. But apart from baking, the life in the sect once Rock, Rock returned was a nightmare. He started spying on his followers. And when he felt like some of them weren't being um, devoted enough, he was going, he um, would punish them. 
If one of them wanted to leave um, the commune, he would beat them so bad that they wouldn't be able to. He would hit them with belts and hammers and suspend them from the ceiling. He would pluck like each and every single hair from their body or he would literally shit on them. Like he would defecate on them, like literally. So now we're going to talk about another day, another death. So now at this cabin, Rock, like this new place that they were living in, Rock seemed to have taken upon a particular dislike to a baby that he had had with one of the members. And there was no explanation for this. He just didn't like this baby. So because he didn't like this baby, he, you know, started to exhibit signs, at least to the mother, that he wanted to do something to this baby. So I guess the mother gave the mother of the baby gave him an idea that, okay, we can take the baby to the snow and just leave him in the snow. So he ordered the mother, yep, go take the baby, put it in a wheelbarrow and then leave it out in the snow in the middle of winter in Canada. That baby obviously died and the county coroner, you know, upon finding this baby declared that this baby had died of SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome. And yeah, it is said that, you know, this mother is actually the one who came up with the idea to leave the baby in the snow. And this was kind of like her act of mercy. Okay. Because she knew that what rock would do to this child would be way worse. And she didn't obviously want her child to suffer. And she knew she had to get rid of this child. And the most pain-free way in her eyes was to leave it out in the snow. And hopefully he would just pass away. But I mean, the baby would be shivering to I can't even imagine the pain that it took her to even make this decision for her child. I wish she instead just ran away with him. Now, after this took place, another child, like a separate child, managed to escape. And I'm sure this child escaped with the help of, you know, his mother. And when this child escaped, he managed to get in um, touch with the police and he made allegations of physical sexual abuse and basically outlined like everything that had been happening to him. And following this, for some freaking reason, again, all the police did was go to the commune and seize more children. So they seized nine children, I believe, at this time. And these were um, these nine children were children that were born into the commune, like during that period of time, they were doing their thing and they were then placed into uh, foster care and after this thankfully any child like any new child that was born into this commune was seized and taken away by child services and given to foster families like thank goodness but again why wasn't more done why didn't they shut this down or something like I don't know what the law was then so then in February of 1987 like my goodness it had been like 10 years at this point Rock throws a knife at his wife, Giselle, after she tried to make her escape from the commune. And he did this in a drunken rage and the knife ends up hitting her thigh and caused it to bleed really heavily. And a few hours later on that wound, a blood clot formed and Rock decides like, okay, I'm just going to take matters into my own hands as he usually does. And he wants to be Dr. Rock again, and he's going to operate. So at first he, ugh, he pokes at this blood clot with like a hot rod, and then he pours boiling water into it. You guys, this really happened. This shit really happens. Surprisingly, but not surprisingly, a week later, Giselle's wound becomes super infected and Rock decides the best course of action is to fill this wound now up with some goodies. So he fills it up with salt, olive oil and spruce gum, which was spruce gum was like a tree bark that they used to drink back. Like they used to make tea from it and drink the tea for like as a medicine back then. And then surprisingly, her leg actually did kind of heal up. So she tried to escape once again, once her leg healed, but she, you know, kind of escaped, but then she kind of came back. She didn't really escape. I have read so many details about the things that Rock would do to his followers. And honestly, we'd be here all day if I was like listing out every single thing that he did. And I'm even struggling to even talk about it because I'm so hormonal at the moment. But other things apart from like, you know, the sledgehammers to the legs and pulling out teeth and things like that with pliers, he would actually make 
his followers do it to each other too. Like he, yeah, he would do most of it, but he would also encourage, not encourage, force his followers to do this stuff to each other. And he would cause miscarriages to his wives by punching them in the stomach. Now, if you guys have ever like read about miscarriages and, you know, being punched and things like that, it's actually not easy to cause a miscarriage that way. And like the abuse that these women would have had to endure to even cause this miscarriage would be a lot. He'd use vice grips on some of the women's nipples until they were bleeding and she, they were screaming. He even bashed one of his horses to death for some God knows who knows why. He would force some of the members to sit down on hot stoves, shoot them in the shoulders with like arrows, break their ribs, force them to eat like dead animals. He burned female members' genitals with torches. Like the list goes on and on and on. And like, you guys get the point. But one of like the most like sickening things I've ever, and I've read some shit in my life. Like the most sickening thing I've ever read in my life was what he did to one of the the members, like one of the worst things I've ever heard of. And he did this to a woman named Sol Solange Boislard, I think was how you say it. So in 1988, again, this woman, for some reason they come to rock and they tell him, you know what? I have a stomach ache. And I don't know why they tell him that knowing that, you know, what he would do, but maybe they actually didn't tell him. Maybe they were just telling someone else. or maybe they were just acting like they had a stomach ache and rocks like, aha. I'm going to fix you. So she, you know, complains about this stomach ache and then Rock says to her, I'm going to treat you tonight. So after he guzzles down a load of alcohol, he then says, we're going to perform an operation. So he begins by forcing an enema of molasses, olive oil and water into her rectum. He then punches her stomach till she opens up her mouth and forces a tube down her throat and then forces his followers to blow into this tube. He then cuts open her stomach and then rips out her intestines with his bare hands. And, you know, he cut open her stomach with just like a kitchen knife. So then he pulls the stuff out and then he sews her back up again. I don't know why. And Solange remained alive and in agony that night, that whole night, until she died the following day. And she died because all like the digestive fluids like leaked into her body and caused like a sepsis, I believe. So they then bury her. Now, to make matters even greater, Rock's like, oh, did you guys forget? Like, I perform resurrections. He was going to resurrect Solange. So he had this, like, epiphany that Solange was pregnant with his baby. So he forced members of, you know, the commune to dig up Solange's body and perform a marriage on them. She's dead and they're married now. And then to bring her back to life, he drills a hole into her skull, cuts out a portion of her skull. He has her skull, like her bones here, right here. With this sword off portion of her skull, he then tells every male member in the commune that they need to ejaculate into this portion of her skull. The ejaculation clearly did not work and neither did the resurrection. Solange remained dead and then Rock grabbed one of her ribs and he began wearing it on a leather like necklace around his neck and after her body was burned and there was only like fragments of bones and things left some of the followers kept some of that and then Rock he took the rest of her remains like her cremated remains into a jar okay and he kept this jar and then he would masturbate into this jar and ejaculate into it because he still believed he had the powers of resurrection. Can you tell me why ejaculate is going to resurrect someone? Like, what is the scientific theory behind that? Or religious theory behind it? I just don't understand. He clearly was a sick... You know what? Are we done yet? Like, the, poli <laughs> the police is still not aware of this. Like, just go and set up a freaking watch outside this commune. Like, what is going on? Like... Ugh. Canada, you guys are too nice out there. So then in November of 1998, a, another member of the commune, her name was Gabrielle. She decides that, well, she doesn't decide. She tells everyone I have a toothache. Don't complain of anything. Don't even say anything about anything. Now, Gabrielle or Gabrielle, if I didn't mention it, was two-year-old Samuel. Remember Samuel? his mother. It took the near death experience of Gabriel 
to bring everything to light. When he found out that Gabriel had a toothache, Iraq goes and starts ripping out her teeth, multiple teeth, not the one with the toothache, with pliers. And later that night, he chases her with a knife for some reason and like cuts one of her tendons in her hands. Then he leaves her alone. Then in July of 1989, so like six months later, he became drunk and now... <sighs> Whenever he became drunk at this point, members of the commune, especially the women, would run away and hide in the bush till he sobered up. And this was including Giselle, his own wife. So a lot of these women, multiple members, managed to sneak away into the bush bushes and hide from rock. But Gabriel wasn't one of them. And they would just sit there and hide because they just were waiting for Rock to just finish doing all his crazy shit and then they can come back out again. So Gabriel didn't. And then he remembered, oh yeah, Gabriel had a like stiff pinky finger, the one that he had already cut off previously with wire cutters. So he told her, put your hand on the table. So instead of even looking at her finger that, you know, he remembered he cut off, he stabs her hand like this, like through here with a knife and like anchors her hand down to the table. Blood began pouring out of her hand, but Rock was just like, Okay, I'm gonna go grab another beer. Gabriel, for some reason, like forced herself somehow to remain conscious the entire time. And it was like 45 minutes till he returned while she was pinned to the table, 45 minutes with blood pouring out of her. He comes back and sees that Gabriel's whole arm had turned blue, obviously. And he goes, that arm's not looking so good, is it? So he goes and gets another knife and then he starts hacking away at her arm in between the shoulder and the elbow, like her upper arm, and just hacks and hacks and hacks at it. He whittled it down all the way to the bone, like the, the flesh. He just kept like beating it till it was down to the bone. And then finally, with the help of another member, he amputates her arm. He just cut it right off. According to, you know, other members there, Gabriel, she didn't cry out, yell, nothing the entire time that was happening. I don't know how she did it. I don't know. The next day, Gabriel, she manages to escape and she actually goes to a woman's shelter, like with this freaking injury. But like she went to receive medical treatment, but she didn't say anything. She actually didn't get any medical treatment. And she comes back to the compound to rock because she says to herself, like, I can't, I can't live without you know, my cult. So a couple days later, um, he looks back at Gabriel and he says, oh, the, you know, the ampu amputated part. He goes, I think it's become uh, like filled with gangrene. So he takes a pair of scissors and he starts like cutting at it. And I'm just like, are you letting him do it? Or like, why don't you run away? Would you, would he force other members to come and grab you? Like, how do these people just sit there and let him do this? Like, I would be like bashing him. I don't know. I would be freaking out but I'm guessing the other members are holding you down or something. So while doing this, he also decides that, you know, something to do with her boob uh, also bothers him. So he cuts off a chunk of her breast, like her left breast, and then he smashes the side of her head with um, the flat side of an ax. And following this is when she freaks out. She runs into the bushes and she hides there for two days where she came to her senses finally. And during this period of time, like the head wound, like wherever he smashed her with an ax, she realizes that like insects had laid eggs into her head. Ooh. So she returns to the cabin and she finds that um, Rock, he um, is still itching to operate and he was super drunk. So they had like old like junkyard cars in, in their area. So Rock orders one of the members to like cut off a piece of like the the drive shaft, like they cut it off with a torch apparently. They then heated this drive shaft, shaft piece of metal until it was like red hot, like hot, hot, hot. And then they pressed it and branded the um, stump of Gabriel. Like she just kept coming back, but being in the woods, like she would have died there, you know? So she came back kind of to get help. So a few days later on August 16th, 1989, she's like, I can't. She's like, she's probably looking at herself going, look at me, look at me. And she decides I'm going to escape. So she makes it to the hospital and she comes up with like some story to the doctors and the, the nurses, like, oh, something about her missing arm. She just comes up with some bogus story. And the hospital was like, what the fuck? This is a lie. So they call the police to investigate and they then decide to charge, like, obviously they knew it was Rock's members. They decide to, um, 
decide to charge Rock with like an aggravated assault charge, not attempted murder for some reason. So they arrive at the compound on August 19th, three days later, 1989. They go to the compound, they start looking for Rock, and then they find the compound's deserted, like everyone's gone. Rock and some of the other members, including two small babies, end up fleeing to Quebec. And crazy enough, the other members, like the remaining members, all fled back to their families. Like, I wonder what made them do that. Like, maybe, I guess we don't know, but maybe, like, when Gabriel left, he knew, like, dang, I'm done for, and he, like, lost it. Maybe he said something that made the other members finally believe like whoa because you know like why would gabriel's injuries cause them to leave like he had done this before this was normal for him so i feel like something must have been said or he must have panicked or maybe he went on like a wild rampage and they finally stood up for themselves who knows maybe then when they realized gabriel finally left they're like shit you know rock's spell was finally broken it took the police six weeks to find rock it wasn't until October 6th, 1989, that Giselle decided to tell anyone about Solange's death. And surprisingly, coincidentally, that was the same day that Rock was arrested. Everyone pleaded guilty to all the charge, like everyone in the commune pleaded guilty to all, to all the charges put against them, including the amputation of Gabriel's arm. Rock got 12 years, which was later reduced to freaking 10 years because he showed genuine remorse for his actions. And others got sentences ranging from like two to five years. And this is all in relation to um, Gabriel, not Solange. Then the police decide to press first degree murder charges for the death of Solange against Rock. But when the, like the police, well, the, when the court found that there wasn't actually sufficient evidence to show intent for first degree murder, Rock's charge was later reduced to second degree murder. And Rock's lawyers made a deal that Rock would plead guilty to this um, charge if they agreed that they would not press any further charges against Rock. And following this, he was sentenced to life in prison. This happened on January 18th in 1993, and he would be eligible for parole apparently in 1999. So there were a lot of members, like his wives, that remained loyal to, to him while he was in prison. Their names were Francine, Chantel, Nicole, Hogla, Tr Ruth, and Deborah. They all remained loyal to him. And the others, you know, that didn't, they tried to like move on and adopt a new life without him. However, in prison, these freaking women, there were so many of them that they were so loyal to him that they would attend every six weeks to have conjugal visits with him. Yeah. To satisfy him. And out of this, he fathered like four children from two different women from these great privileges he was granted. Why was he even allowed to do this? This, sh this shouldn't have been a thing. The guards at the prison that were looking after Rock actually said that he was very charming. Okay. They said he was super charismatic and he actually got on the news again because there was like this auction um, on some website about his like paintings and artwork and things like that. People were trying to sell it. His poetry, things he had written. I mean, who wants poetry from him? But I think like people were so like obsessed with him that he became like this cult figure, like lit literally like a cult figure not a cult leader like a cult figure but it seemed like karma finally caught up with rock at the age of 63 years old when a fellow inmate actually his cellmate his name was matthew mcdonald he was 60 at the time he stabbed rock in the neck with a shiv while in jail apparently um they had like an argument or a fight before this took place and that's when matthew did that to um rock but after matthew did it he drops the shiv, he calmly walks over to the guards and he says, that piece of shit is down on the range. Here's the knife, I've sliced him up good. And he gives them like the knife slash shiv. Matthew was already serving a life sentence in prison for murder. So why not mate, why not? So this is finally the end of this horrific story. It's taking me like three hours to film this guys. Cause I think I kept like stopping and like, it's so difficult to talk about this kind of stuff and <sighs> So, so hard. Rock used to try and make excuses for his behavior by talking about this abusive childhood he had, to which his, you know, everyone around him basically denied except for the neighbors. He was notorious for making up lies. And I mean, all cult leaders have been known to be great liars. Was it his stomach operations due to his ulcers during his first marriage to Francine? Is that what caused him to change? Or was it his childhood? Or was he just born this way? I actually feel really sorry for cult members after reading this and also watching that documentary on Netflix. I had never really known about it before. I never understood it in the past, you know? 
I feel we all judge cult members as evil or crazy or psycho or they, they're stupid, like idiots, you know? But most of the time, these poor people, they're just really easily manipulated and they're looking for something to believe in. And that's why these people prey on them. Looking for a way out of maybe bad situations and they somehow end up in worse ones. I'm so glad this case is over, you guys. I'm gonna go chill out now because mama needs a break. Let me know your thoughts on this case today, guys. Thanks for suggesting it since I probably never would have heard about it. And yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one, guys. Besitos. Mwah. Bye.